said in early church it's great to have bells to um, start things out on Sunday morning especially when it's kind of a dreary one like uh, this weekend so thank you guys that was a wonderful way to begin our time together if you are visiting with us today we'd like to extend you a special welcome but welcome to everybody glad that you could be in worship with us today but if you are visiting there's a um, info card in the P rack in front of you. You can fill that out and put it in the offering plate later in the service. We'd appreciate that. We'd like to know that you were here. And also, if you'd like to know uh, more information about Trinity, you can mark that on there as well. Uh, we have several announcements to go over. If you have your bulletin and want to look along with me, uh, I'll try to go in, in order today. Uh, we have a young adult lunch at Mason's Deli. That's right after this service. And they'll, they'll meet over here by the organ. Uh, praise team lunch today and practice that will be in the youth room right after this service and also after the service no lunch but there's a Perry County uh, mission trip meeting and that will be in a 109 just right down this hallway on the way to the offices.
Then tonight we have Valentine Banquet. Um, that's from 5 to 7 p.m. with good food and entertainment. Child care is provided. If uh, we have a few extra plates, if you forgot to sign up or, or your plans have changed and you can sign up, uh, the sheet is still out in the gathering area, so you can put your name down there. It is also a youth fundraiser, so uh, youth who are working uh, the banquet tonight need to be here at 4.30 and meet Jessica and get your assignments and we'll we'll go from there. Um, tomorrow night we uh, have a uh, young adult Bible study was on the calendar. We have some folks out of town so there will not be young adult Bible study uh, tomorrow night so it will meet again in a couple of weeks. Um, Wednesday night we have our regular supper um, but also our Ash Wednesday service and that begins at 6.15 here in the sanctuary. Our children's missions groups, um, RAs, GAs, and mission friends, they will all meet as usual at 6 that night. But parents are welcome to bring uh, their children if they're interested in bringing them to the service instead. So that's your, your choice. But the uh, youth will be a part of the uh, Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday night. Um, and then finally, spring... Food bins are available for pickup if you would like to help uh, an elderly um, person in our community through Madison, Madison Assistance Program. Um, like we do at Christmas, we do the Christmas bins and we also do a spring one. Um, but they are available in the gathering area and you can sign up for one there. Um, our rosebud that's over here next to the piano is for Bodie Lee Wells Kiefer. He was born this week to Aaron and Zach Kiefer and proud sister, big sister Evie. Um, uh, everyone is doing well and adjusting well and um, he's a very good baby so far. So uh, they're letting him sleep a little bit and that sort of thing. But um, just remember this family as they, they celebrate uh, their growth as a, as a family. And at this time, I now, uh, invite you to please stand for the waving of the peace. No passing. <laughs> All right. Kids sing.
Well, bells and children singing. You got the double treat this morning. That is a wonderful way to begin worship together. We don't see the rehearsals on Sunday night, so we don't see the bells rehearsed, but we are grateful for the, the work of those leaders and those ringers and singers and parents who bring their children here uh, and just appreciate all that you do in teaching our, our children about music. In worship today, we will continue with stories of Jesus in the book of John. Um, there's an interesting interaction between Jesus and a man who has been blind from birth. Um, it's another healing on the Sabbath, so religious leaders uh, get involved, and even the man's parents, which is a little interesting. So today we look at the story of the man born blind. Welcome to worship. Please pray with me. Oh God, we are blind to so many things you have for us in this world. Open our eyes and our hearts this morning to your presence, to your blessings, and to your grace in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now sing together our song of praise, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. You can find the words printed on the front of your worship order. I invite you to please stand as we sing together. Thank you. 
Please be seated. Good morning. At this time in our service, I'd like to invite you to quiet your mind, quiet your heart, and listen to God. Let Him speak to us this morning. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Powerful Lord, I just ask that you put aside all anxious thoughts and let you in. Let us hear your voice and feel your arms wrapped around us. Let us hear that calling. I ask these things in your name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 9. We'll be reading verses 1 and 2 and verses 18 through 23. We're we'll reading from the NIV version. Again, it's John chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 and 18 through 23. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Verse 18. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for uh, the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was bl born blind? How is it now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, and who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who had already d had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. May God bless the reading of his word. At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of unity, hymn number 382, God the Father of Your People. Please stand as we sing together.
be seated. During the Christmas season and during the Easter season, Trinity partners with Madison Assistance Program to provide food bins for families in need. The food bins will contain things like pancake mix, cornmeal, flour, spaghetti, and a jar of spaghetti sauce. It will also contain yams, a box of potato flakes, several cans of vegetables, cranberry sauce, a cake mix, and icing. The list and empty bins are available in the gathering area. Some Trinity families choose to fill one of the empty bins together. They take that opportunity to talk as a family about why some people need help and that we have a responsibility for others. Some of our adult Sunday school classes choose to fill several bins as a class project. Please pray silently for those all those who fill these bins and for those who will receive the bins as well. Amen. morning. It's good to see you. Welcome to Trinity. I'm so glad that you're with us today. What a good day of worship we've already had. I wanted to just let you know something real quick. On Wednesday, we celebrate uh, the service called Ash Wednesday. It's a little bit new for some of us. I never grew up uh, doing that. The first Christians would almost always baptize on Easter, and they would take the weeks ahead of Easter to prepare the new converts for the great day of Easter to baptize. They would get a white robe on the day they were baptized as a reminder that they were new people in Jesus Christ. That preparation time over, over time became known as Lent, 
And we sort of do that here at Trinity. We spend time thinking about our spiritual preparation so that the day of Easter comes, we shout with all our hearts, with great gladness, the good news of Jesus Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. So we'll be talking about spiritual practices and things we can do, things we may give up, things we may take up uh, during Lent. Ash Wednesday sort of kicks that off. And one of the things I want to invite you to is here in our sanctuary is a service. And that service, we will impose the ashes. If you choose, you don't have to. You can put it on your forehead or I'll put it on your, your hand if you'd like. It's just a reminder that we live under the sign of the cross, the great sacrifice of love that Jesus gave for us. It reminds us about the role to be a serious disciple of Jesus. So I want to let you know about that. You're welcome to attend the service. It's really more of a casual service in a lot of ways. Look forward, hopefully, if you want to participate that and begin your spiritual journey, all of us together as we get ready for Easter. So let's think about our text for today, the story of the man born blind. But I want you to think, first of all, about a voice. Think about the voice of Jesus. What does it sound like to you? What do you think there was in the voice of Jesus? Voices carry a lot of power. We know that they can persuade us. People have certain distinctiveness to their voices, and we recognize them because of that. There are famous voices, for example, that we've heard before, James Earl Jones, who was uncredited in the first two Star Wars as the voice of Darth Vader. Very distinctive voice. One of the lines that he has is, You have failed me for the last time, Admiral. You remember Darth Vader? I've always liked Sean Connery, one of my favorite James Bond. Bond, James Bond. You like that? Eddie Murphy and Shrek busting into the church at the wedding, riding on a big dragon saying, I'm a donkey on the edge. Or Ellen DeGeneres is Dory in Finding Nemo, talking to Nemo's dad. When life gets you down, you know what you got to do. Keep on swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Or Jack Nicholson on the lawyer's stand saying, you can't handle the truth. Margaret Thatcher, I remember her in the 80s, standing before a group of people and she said, here I am in my red evening gown, my face softly made up, my wavy hair all curled, the Iron Lady of the Western world. It's a pretty powerful voice. What about the power of voice in your life? There was a study at Stanford some years ago, and it talked about the idea of the premise that we share our emotions, how we're feeling, and you can hear it in the voice. Have you ever heard someone's feeling or their emotions and their voices? In the study, they asked people to describe how they were feeling at the moment, and they would write down angry or sad or happy or whatever, and then they had to read something, and they recorded it. But when they played back the recording for the individuals, they changed it. They sort of did something with the technology of the recording, so their voices sounded quite different from the actual recording. And the researchers said, we expected people would say, well, this is some really otherworldly, strange situation voice. That's not me. That's not how I was feeling. But instead, the respondents, upon hearing their voice all changed, changed the, the response on how they felt at the time they were saying it. The power of the voice actually impacted how they were feeling. So what about Jesus' voice? What about His voice? There must have been something in His voice. He could say to the storms, be still. He could say to demons, be gone. And they were. On the Emmaus Road on Easter, the disciples are walking back to their home and they remember later the voice of Jesus talking about the Scriptures. And they said, how our hearts burn when He talked to us about that on Easter morning. Mary is there at the empty tomb wondering where Jesus is. She doesn't recognize Him until He speaks. It's His voice with a simple word of her name, Mary. Jesus tells us that we are His sheep. And all of His sheep will know and recognize the voice of their shepherd. So what does it sound like? What did it sound like? Can you imagine the voice of Jesus? Was it gravelly? Was it high-pitched? Was He a slow, draw speaker or a fast speaker? Was it soft? Was it deep, like a bass voice? The blind man only has the voice of Jesus to go on. And somehow he listens to that voice and he allows Jesus to put a paste of spit and dirt, mud, onto his eyes. He allows Jesus to tell him directions which he follows. He has nothing but the voice of Jesus to go on. And because he listens to the voice of Jesus, he becomes a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
This is a great story in chapter 9. I encourage you to read it 1 through 41 later this afternoon. The story begins with the disciples and Jesus walking along and they observe this man who apparently has been blind since the day he was born. And the disciples' first response upon seeing this blind man is to wonder about who caused it. Whose sin caused this? This was part of their thinking in that day. Was it the parents or was it the guy himself? Though he was in the womb, so I don't know what sin he he committed then. But anyway, they think that and they ask that of Jesus. And Jesus says, neither his parents nor he has sinned, but the works of God can be manifest in this man's life. And then he begins to put the mud paste together with his spit. He goes, the man goes, finding his way through those streets of Jerusalem to the pool of Salaam. He washes. He can see. He goes back to his old neighborhood where people who can see physically apparently have not paid a lot of attention to him. They at first don't recognize the man who can now see. They don't know who he is. He tries to identify himself to him. And then, instead of being very glad for him, they're they're questioning him. How did this happen? Who did it? Well, it was a man named Jesus. And so, not being satisfied, they take him to the Pharisees, which is not really a good thing in the New Testament. They're going to interrogate you, and they interrogate this man. And they want to know, who did this? What happened? How did it happen? He describes the spit mud on his face and the washing in the pool of Salaam. And then they say, well, who do you think he is? And he says, I think he's a prophet. And they're disagreeing about it. And some say, I don't think this guy was ever blind in the first place. Let's call his parents in to confirm it. And the parents enter into the situation with fear. They are afraid, and it identifies very much with John's church, a gospel written much later in the first century, when many Christians had in the Jewish context been kicked out of the synagogue, had been cast out. So they identify with this fear, and the parents say, he's our boy, that's for sure, and he was born blind. But we know him, and we believe if you just talk to him, he's old enough, and he's willing enough, and he's able enough to describe his own situation to you. And so he does. They go back to the man again, and they ask him about the situation, and he says one of the great lines of testimony we've ever heard, I don't know a lot, but what I do know is once I was blind, and now I see. And then he adds a very logical statement. He says to the Pharisees, you've been saying that God doesn't listen to sinners. Well, it's a really strange thing to me, because in the whole history of the world, we've never heard of anybody born blind who then was healed and could see. This could only have happened by an act of God. So if this guy did it and God worked through him, then I think I know who he is, even though you may not. They get so upset, they cast him out. And in the last scene of the story, Jesus finds him. He doesn't know where Jesus is, but Jesus knows where he is. And he finds him and he says to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy says, who is he? And Jesus says, it's the one you've been listening to. And now you can see. And the man says, yes, I believe. It's a very powerful story. And often, because it's John's gospel and John loves symbolism, particularly darkness and light, we describe spirituality as blindness. Remembering that there are people who are blind, we still use that description. Blindness, darkness. And then you can see clearly, and that's more spiritual. That's more Jesus' way. And light. And there is truth to that. Those who reject Jesus remain in the dark in John's view of the gospel. Those who accept Jesus begin to grow like this man did in their understanding of who the Son of God is. I was struck this week by Gerber Baby Food Company. They picked their new baby, their little baby that will be on the jars, I guess. Did you see that? 91-year history of Gerber. Uh, they picked a Down syndrome 18-month-old child named Lucas. And if you need, you need to go look and see Lucas. His smile will just brighten your day. It makes you want to go out and buy some Gerber baby food. Although probably not the one with the mixture of peas and carrots and spinach. I just still can't get that one. Their slogan, you may know, is every baby a Gerber baby. 
and every baby, not every baby as we wish they would be, is they were born a different way, but every baby as they are born, a Gerber baby. And that brought me back to this story. I can only imagine what this blind man, a beggar, had been through. It was not uncommon for healers to believe that there was some medicinal properties in saliva. And for this man, I imagine possibly someone else had spit and put it on his eyes. I don't know. But in this story, he no longer asks to be healed. Maybe over time he has no longer requesting those kinds of things. He's been through that so many times before. And he lives in an environment where religion has blamed him for the way he was born. That's what the disciples, heroes in the New Testament, first think. Jesus, was it his sin that caused him to be less than? Or was it the sin of his parents that caused him to be less than? And maybe he's given up and soured on religion and on medicine. I don't know, but there must have been something in the voice of Jesus where he allowed Jesus to put spit and dirt and rub it on his face, where he said yes to Jesus in the directions of making his way still blind through the narrow, hard streets of Jerusalem to that pool of Siloam. And it had to be a long journey for him. The Pool of Siloam, you may know, was created many, many years ago. Uh, back in the Old Testament days, King Hazai is the king of Jerusalem, and they are under attack. The city is going to be under siege, but their water source is outside the walls, the Gihon Spring. So they cover over the springs, and they begin to dig a tunnel four or five football fields long underneath Jerusalem. To this day, the water still flows from that spring through Hezekiah's tunnel, to this new pool that was created called the Pool of Siloam, the place where Jesus sent him. I've been through that tunnel a couple of times, and I have a blackmail photo of myself coming out of that tunnel, which I know where it is and it will remain hidden. But I, for some reason back in the 80s when I went through, I came out and decided to stand on one of the old ruined columns, got an Alabama tank, church, uh, tank uh, top shirt on, and my, I'm doing this or something, weighing all of 170 pounds probably, I don't know. It's pretty embarrassing to this day, and I know where it is, and you're not going to find it. Just want you to know that. <laughs> but there's a process to this. We often think that when you come to Jesus, boom, the light changes, the light comes on, the, flip, the, the, the light switch is flipped, and all of a sudden what you were before is gone and what you are is immediately present. But usually it is the case that God has been working in our lives way before the moment we walked the trail or the path or the aisle or made our decision to accept Jesus. And Jesus continues the process of working in our lives way beyond that. Similar to this man, at first he says to his neighbors, he is a man named Jesus. Later he'll say, I think he's a prophet. Later he talks about this man being worthy of disciples. He says to the Pharisees, you want to be one of his disciples? But he gets a little tease in there, doesn't he? And then later he comes to the place of saying, I believe you are the Son of Man, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. It's a process for him. And the process is not just that. The process includes him becoming all that God dreams for you and me. That includes his willingness to stand up to interrogators who look at him and define him only by the way he was born, who look at him as a less than human being, a cause for you to be this way. He stands up to those interrogators and something, I think, about Jesus' voice drew him up to his full stature so he could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the greatest debaters in Jerusalem there. His parents are brought in, and they're afraid. But I think there's more to them. I think that sometimes parents, they hope and they dream and they see in their children more than what other people may see. Sometimes other people see the children and they make judgments based on their identity or the things they've done this occasion that occasion or just the way they were born and parents sometimes have the ability to see deeper than that 
And I think they knew their child. And I think there's fear here, but I think they also were saying to the Pharisees, go ask him. You know, he's really, there's a lot more to him than what you see. Go ask him and see what he says and let him tell his own story. When I was in college at Jacksonville State, I enlisted to be one of the Big Brothers, Big Brother, Big Sister program. You might be familiar with that. And I didn't know who they were going to give me, but they gave me a child with intellectual disabilities. I did not expect that. And I was a college student, and I was very worried about how I would handle that. I had not been around that situation before. Um, and John's mother was very attentive to John, and she wanted him to have the best big brother ever. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do this. She would call and say, you need to do this and that. She'd call the BCM and ask for the campus minister, say, where's Mike? He needs to do this with John. And so I, would, I did, I thought my best. I would take him places to eat, and we loved to go to Cecil's. He loved the upside down milkshakes we could get there, hand dipped. Um, he was a good swimmer. I remember being there when he won a medal in the Special Olympics for swimming. He was so proud and he came up and you know, he had that medal and he was showing it to me. It was really amazing to me. He drew me a picture once that I thought was pretty awesome that he did. I can tell you this, he blessed me a whole lot more, I'm sure, than I blessed him. And I learned a lot from John. But one of the things I learned about the whole situation is his mama saw in him something it took me a little while to see. His parents saw more in him than what an outsider could see. I think that's going on here. And so when he goes and stands before these Pharisees, professional debater, debaters and interrogators, he is probably uneducated. He's probably been underserved and much underappreciated throughout his whole life. And yet he shares important things with them. Under the pressure of that interrogation, when others were afraid, he shared his simple testimony. I don't know everything. But what I do know is I was blind, and now I can see. And then he shares a reasoned argument. He shows a high quality of thinking, of logic. If God doesn't listen to sinners, okay. But this is something only God could do. A man born blind now could see, and it worked through Jesus. So maybe God's listening to Jesus and using him. I'm thinking maybe he's not just a man named Jesus. I'm thinking he's a prophet worthy of disciples. It's an amazing statement. It all makes me think, would this story have as much power to us if the man didn't get his sight back? I think so. Jesus says, without any request for healing, without really any talk about it, he says, neither the parents nor this man have sinned, but that the works of God may be manifest in him, as he is. And sure enough, that's the whole story here, isn't it? The works of God manifest in a person that had been labeled, called disabled, called unworthy. Who knows what else? There's a place in the Bible that says you and I have this treasure in clay pots. It is true that people don't always see what we're really about. We sometimes don't see all of what we're capable, but God sees it. God sees it in you and me as we are, not as we wish we would be, but as we were born and created to be. In our own humanity, God sees the treasure that is us, that is the bearing of His good news, the works of God capable of happening in any life. In fact, these people, it's so easy to overlook Him. He goes back to His neighborhood, and it's sort of astounding to me, but I do sort of relate. I remember at my maybe 20th high school reunion, Craig came. Craig was a year behind us. I don't know why he came to our reunion, but he did. He was a nice guy. I hadn't seen him in 20 years. He hollered over to me at one point, hey, Mike. And I looked, and I finally realized that was Craig. And I said, Craig. And I said, I never would have recognized you. And, you know, that's probably not what you say at the reunion, right? Now, he lost a lot of hair. He gained a lot of bulk weight. But you don't say that. Everybody at the reunion wants to look like they used to look like, right? I, it was a dumb thing to say. That's sort of the, what I saw at the time. This guy goes back to his neighborhood, and they have really never seen him. They've looked at him, but they've never seen him. They question, is it really you? <laughs> yeah, it's me. I've lived here my whole life. 
And then they, they don't have a party. They don't jump up and down for the man born blind who can see. They don't praise the Lord. They quarrel. And then they drag him to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees really don't care if he's blind or not. They're more concerned about their laws and their religious rules. And so they say to him, you know, it's illegal to knead bread on the Sabbath. It's the same with kneading spit and dirt into mud. You can't knead. That's work. And he says, but I was blind and now I can see. And they say, well, that's beside the point. <laughs> what? And the disciples of Jesus, their first thought on seeing the guys that he's less than they are. He's less than the real ideal of a person. And they think that something's happened to him because of his mismanagement of his life, because of the sinfulness of his parents. There's more to people than we can see. Sometimes what we do is we say something about somebody based on the little that we have seen. And we call them names. We say things about them. We label them troubled disabled, less than, no good. And sometimes people hear it. And they hear it enough, they begin to live into the labels that they've been given. Have you ever been labeled? Choose the voices that you listen to carefully. At RA camp, which is in Chaco Springs, the Baptist Boys Camp, I worked there two summers in college. Every year we had one week that was deaf week. The Talladega School, the deaf is there, and the students would come. And I always had the younger students. For some reason, I got that joy in that job. And it was really amazing to me. They're very much wanting to touch you all of the time. I wonder if that was part of what Jesus did, having to touch the man. Jesus could have just spoken it, but he touched him. They like to touch, and if you didn't look at them, because they're so expressive with their faces, the students would grab my face and just say, you know, look at me. And somewhere along the line, apparently no one had told them that they couldn't go to camp because they were deaf. They didn't, nobody told them that you can't start a campfire or learn to tie a knot or sleep in tents or hike a trail. Nobody told them that. In fact, I think somebody told them they could and they believed that they could. My dad is blind now. Has always been a world traveler. He's loved to travel and see the world. He can no longer see the world anymore. He's a bridge master. He cannot play bridge anymore. He's great at chess. He won the state championship in Alabama when he was a student there many years ago. I have a great picture of Thomas playing chess with my dad who can't see. And he says, I'm going to knock the men over every once in a while, but I can feel which is which. By the way, he's smart enough that he could sit on the couch and still beat you playing chess when you got the board in front of you. And he loves maps. He's always loved maps, looking in maps, pouring over them. I remember one time he got upset with my uncle because my uncle didn't know where Gaul was. I mean, ancient Rome, Gaul, who knows? But he's, he can't do that anymore. And it's, it's tough for me to think about that for him. But one thing I've noticed is he complains about a lot of stuff, but he's never complained about being blind. Never complained. You call him and he'll say, how are you doing? How's Mary? How are the boys? There's more to you than people can see. There's more to you than maybe you can see. God sees it. And God speaks to us in various ways. And He speaks to us to draw us up, to allow us to be the people that God created us to be, that God dreams that we can be. People look at us and we have, all of us, disabilities, limitations, and lack. And sometimes people label us because of it. And so because of that, this story, the heading in my Bible and maybe yours is, the man born blind. That's the way we know him for the rest of time. But maybe a better title is, the man who listened to the voice of Jesus. Wouldn't that be better? Because that, to me, is the true miracle of the story. What was it that he heard? that Jesus said to him, that drew him up, that drew him out, to drew him to the whole fullness of his stature. I don't know for sure. I know that Jesus had a voice that could make waves be still and demons run away. He had a voice that called people to him from all walks of life. They said when he taught, he taught as one with authority. But mostly, his voice affects people. 
Jesus said things that changed the course of people's lives. Come and follow me and I'll make you fish for people. Arise, daughter, for there is no one here to condemn you. Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. Yeah, I know your name. I know you. And there's more to you than the people of this village can see. There's more to you than you can see in yourself. That voice of Jesus. And I think it still moves us, if we'll listen to it, to be better than we can imagine we can be. Sometimes we don't get to see very far the path ahead of us, the situations we have to face, but the voice abides, the voice of God. So my question for you today is what is the voice of Jesus saying to your life now? Come forth, go tell, go wash, trust me. And be careful if you listen to the voice. Because that voice of Jesus will not leave us the same. We will be transformed in the way we think, in the way we hope, the way we vote, the way we act, the things we say, the, the way we look and make judgments of other people. You may find yourself one day, because you've been listening to the voice of Jesus, walking through town with mud on your face. But it is the best voice of all. At the end of the story, the man doesn't know where Jesus is, but Jesus is never far from us. And Jesus finds him, and he says to them, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he said, Who is he? And Jesus says, It's the one you've been listening to. And now you can see. And he says, I believe you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. One day we will see Jesus face to face, as He is. Until that day, most of us will not be able to see very far down the path, but we will all be able, if we listen, to hear the voice of Jesus. And I believe it is enough for us to say to Jesus, with my life, I will serve you because I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, We'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep